Hi, this is Pastor Daryl Myatt from Keller, Texas. Today is Tuesday, April 18th, 2017. This channel is all about world news, Bible prophecy, end time events, and the return of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Hope you have your taxes done. Today's the actual deadline this year since I guess the 15th fell on Saturday. So, hope you're not one of those rushing to the post office at midnight tonight just to get it postmarked. <laughs> Anyway, let's get right into it today. Out of the Washington Post, <coughs> excuse me, headline says White House warns North Korea not to test U.S. resolve, offering Syria and Afghanistan strikes as examples. Vice President Pence warned North Korea not to test U.S. military might by pursuing its nuclear weapons program, saying, hey, uh, did you see what we did in Syria and Afghanistan? Okay, we have some strength, we have some resolve. Don't mess with us. It's a different administration than the one you're used to dealing with. We will do what we say we do. We draw a line, you cross it, we're going to punch your face. We're going to knock you out. Um, Trump and Pence trying to persuade North Korea to abandon its nuclear weapons program through peaceful means, but repeated the administration's warning that all options are on the table as they send some more naval vessels there. Out of Zero Hedge, I've seen this in other places, U.S. deploys two more aircraft carriers toward Korean Peninsula. Um, the USS Carl Vinson is already expected to arrive uh, here in just a few days. They're also now sending the Ronald Reagan and the Nimitz carrier groups. Couldn't tell you what's going to happen. I can tell you this, though, if Donald Trump says, beware, you might want to beware, North Korea. He seems to be a man of his word and a man of action. Who knows what might come of this? Uh, I know so many people are thinking, oh my goodness, World War III is upon us. This is going to happen, that's going to happen. World War III is the most searched phrase currently on Google. Very interesting. Out of BBC, Pence says U.S. Arab strategic patience with North Korea is over. He said, yeah, we're not going to just sit back and be like, oh, those North Koreans, they're at it again. He said, no, we're going to take action. He made these remarks while he was at the DMZ, the demilitarized zone, the area that divides North Korea from South Korea. Um, he's saying, yeah, uh, our strategic patience with North Korea is over, and the previous U.S. administration is no longer here. He said, we have a new president, and he takes action, and he shows strength and resolve. And North Korea would do well not to test his resolve or the strength of the armed forces of the United States in this region. He reiterated to South Korea, saying, we're with you 100%. Very interesting. Who knows? Uh, also out of the BBC, North Korea says, we will test missiles weekly, senior official tells the BBC said, we'll be conducting more missile tests on a weekly, monthly, and yearly basis. He said that an all-out war would result if the United States took military action. It's kind of strange. You know, if you're going to start launching ballistic missiles, testing them, and, and having nuclear tests, who's the one provoking whom in this case? Just amazing. Just amazing. Out of the hill, North Korea says thermonuclear war may break out at any minute. Thermonuclear war. A senior North Korean official said the U.S. has created a dangerous situation in which a thermonuclear war may break out at any minute. <clears throat> hmm. A lot of people are watching this. A lot of people are curious to see what's going to happen. 
course, we're hearing from a lot of the Hillary supporters going, see, see, told you he'd take us to war. Hillary should have been president. Uh, out of Fox News, Iran says it will seek no one's permission to build up military. Iran's president, Hassan Rouhani, what appeared to be a defiant message to President Trump, said Tehran will seek no one's permission to build missiles. The strengthening of the cap capability of the Iranian armed forces is only for defending the country, and we will ask no one's permission to build up the armed forces and to build missiles and aircraft, Rouhani said at an event showcasing some of Iran's military hardware. Did you see the plane that Iran rolled out? A lot of people are very skeptical about it, going, yeah, I don't know, I'd like to see it fly. <clears throat> hmm. Iran claiming they're only defensive weapons? Then why do they have missiles that can travel for 800 miles? That's not a defensive weapon, that's going into someone else's country. Just saying. Just saying. Um... Did you see the whole thing with Turkey? You know, this news has kind of snuck in under the wire. This, this is kind of something that might have bigger implications. Out of The Guardian, uh, I've seen it in other places, uh, Erdogan's referendum victory spells the end of Turkey as we know it. This story says, Turkey as we know it is over with this referendum on its constitution. It's over. It's history. Um, <clears throat> now, Turkey has uh, kind of changed the way they're going to do things. It's no longer going to be the kind of government they had before. It's basically going to be saying, Oh, Erdogan, you're in charge. You make the calls. You do what you want. Wow, a lot of people think this has some serious biblical implications. Um, saying that now the Gog-Magog war is looming large on the horizon and that Turkey and Iran are basically vying for preeminent power in the Middle East. Of course, this will be, you know, Sunni Muslims versus Shia Muslims, uh, something that's been going on for centuries. But we need to keep an eye on this. We need to watch Turkey and Iran and see exactly what's going to happen. You know, now Turkey's going to have this authoritarian government. Um, so democracy in Turkey's over. It's a thing of the past. It's going to be more of a dictatorship. And who knows where that might lead? Again, keep an eye on them. Out of Israel, Hayom, China urges correcting historical injustice to allow Palestinian state. Okay. Saying the world needs to find a solution for issues in the Middle East. And creating a Palestinian state is one way to do it. This injustice must be corrected, China said. More people in the world still pushing this two-state solution that can never work, at least not in Israel's favor. Maybe it's going to take that, that Israel is divided to the point that they can no longer defend themselves so that God can step in and say, look, it's not Israel's mighty military, it's me. I'm the one defending Israel. I'm the one fighting against those who fight against Jerusalem. This is biblical. Out of World Net Daily. Uh, is that where I got this one? Yes, World Net Daily. Push to rebuild Jerusalem Temple has earth-shaking implications. Ah, rebuilding the temple. They have this picture that looks quite amazing. It's actually... You see some cranes on the horizon, which you see in Jerusalem all over the place, but they're showing an actual vision of the third temple built on the Temple Mount. And if I'm looking at this correctly, 
It looks like they have it in the place where the Al-Aqsa Mosque currently is. Keep in mind the Dome of the Rock was built over the place that was the Holy of Holies in the First and Second Temple. So the Dome of the Rock is really closer to the area where the Third Temple should be. The Al-Aqsa Mosque, I think, can still exist on the Temple Mount even when they do build the Third Temple, which kind of goes on to speak about the fact that the Temple Mount would be shared as according to um, Revelation 11. It says the Gentiles would trample it for three and a half years. A lot of people watching for the rebuilding of the temple, they, they understand that the sooner that's built, the sooner we're going to see Christ return. Um, a lot of Jews interested in seeing it built. A lot of Christians interested in seeing it built. Several Muslims are actually wanting to see this built. I think we're a lot closer to this actually happening than we've ever been before. Since it was destroyed in 70 AD. So, again, just another thing to keep an eye on. Because I think the sooner we see that temple built, <coughs> the sooner we see Christ return. A lot of things happening. It's amazing how... So many Christians were killed in Egypt on Palm Sunday. Uh, I think it's what, 48, 49 people killed, several more wounded. Seems like the West is turning their back on some of the very heartland of where the Christian faith was born. You know, it seems like the Western world has gotten used to seeing Christians persecuted in the Middle East as if it's inevitable, if, as if that's their lot in life. Thinking that, oh, well, Christianity's going to die, then I guess what better place to have it die than where it was born? There's been Christians in that area for over 2,000 years. Islamists present themselves as invaders or foreign agents, soiling a land that should be exclusively dedicated to Islam. Um... Christians, the most persecuted group of people on the planet currently today. Jesus said, the world would hate you for my name. If it hated me, it will hate you also, he said. Seems like war is being waged against Christians, a genocide against Christianity. Of course, this has been going on for quite some time, but maybe not quite... To this extent, you ever ask yourself, God, why am I here? You ever get on your knees and say, Lord, wh why did you make me? Wh what is my purpose? What, what am I supposed to do while I'm here? You ever felt that or ask God that? I think the purpose of humanity is to become the spiritual children of God. And that can only happen through accepting Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Um, people feel insignificant. They feel like they don't matter, like our lives mean nothing. Um, seems like we're living in a world that's kind of lost focus. You know, the Bible speaks God's truth. God speaks to us about his purpose for us. God's creating a family. We have the incredible opportunity to be part of that family, the family of God, through Jesus Christ the Son. In 1 John, uh, 1 John 1, starting in, uh, no, 1 John 3, starting in verse 1. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore, the world knows us not because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when, we sh when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that has this hope in him purifies himself, even as he is pure. Here's God offering you hope. He's offering you a future. 
He's offering you a fulfilling, meaningful life right now. You can have relation, a relationship with God the Father, the creator of the universe, every day. God wants to have a personal relationship with you. He wants to have a one-on-one -on -one relationship with you. We are children of God if we've accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. You were made for a God. You were made by a God who's involved in your life. Psalm 139, verses 13 and 14. For you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. We're reminded that God formed us. He made us. Like the potter makes the clay, the pot. We were put together in our mother's womb by the creator of all the universe. O Lord, you have searched me. You know me. You know my sitting down, my rising up. You understand my thought afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down and are acquainted with my ways. Psalm 139, verses 1 through 3. God knows all about his creation. God knows everything. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, says Psalm 139, verse 6. I like to be reminded of God's promises and God's word, that God's at work in those that he's made his own. Um, you know, I don't think we should be surprised when our pursuits of pleasure leave us feeling a little empty or unsatisfied. You know, King Solomon tried to find purpose in life. He strove after everything, all kinds of indulgences in this life, only led him to a, a meaningless striving after wind. Ecclesiastes 1, verse 14. Solomon tried everything. He pursued everything. He wanted to find out what his purpose was but he needed to focus on the ultimate purpose. And that was God himself. I think those thousand women got Solomon a little distracted. You know, he had 700 wives and 300 concubines. Or was it the other way around? 300 wives, seven? There was a thousand women Solomon had at his disposal any time he wanted to have them at his disposal. Uh, Romans 8, 16 and 17 says the Spirit itself, this is speaking of God's Holy Spirit, the Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. How amazing is that? How important is that? It kind of tells us why we're here, the very reason why God created us, why we're born. It gives meaning to our lives. It explains why God wants all people to come to the knowledge of the truth. God's creating a family, his own family. And we have the wonderful, glorious opportunity to be part of that family through Jesus Christ. Joint heirs with him. What Christ has, we have. Jesus said, all authority in heaven and earth is given to me. And here we have the opportunity to be a joint heir with Christ, to have what Christ has. All authority in heaven and earth? Wow. So don't let the devil's lies get you down. Don't let depression or anxiety or the fact that you don't have enough money to pay all your bills, don't let that get you down. This is not our home. This is not our final destination. We're not of the world. We're in the world. We're not of the world. Jesus said we're not of this world. In John 7, verse 17, it says, and this is Jesus talking, he said, if any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. He that speaks of himself seeks his own glory, but he that seeks his glory that sent him, the same is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. You know, it seems like the world we live in today is like a multiple choice society. When I was in school, 
I always preferred the multiple choice kind of test, or, or true and false, that was even better. You had a 50-50 shot instead of a you know 25% chance. Um, multiple choice. You know, there's so many options every day, every moment. Hey, when you wake up in the morning, oh, well, you know, what socks should I put on? What, what, what shirt should I wear? What pants? What shoes? You know, what should I have for breakfast? Um, it can be a little overwhelming sometimes if you let it be. Um, I don't think decisions like, you know, what, what color shirt to wear or, or whether you put mustard or mayonnaise on your hamburger is really that important in the grand scheme of things. But there are other choices that we're called on to make that can be life-changing life-shaping choices. You know, the choice to be faithful to your husband or your wife, or the decision to be honest, even when nobody's looking. Um, making the right choice, I think, is very important in our Christian walk. You know, people like Adam and Eve made poor choices. We all make poor choices. In Adam and Eve's case, the human race will forever be paying for their poor choice. People like Moses, Daniel, Joseph, they made good choices. Abraham, they made good choices that showed that they were people of great faith. I think making the right choice is very important because our lives are shaped by the decisions we make. I mean, we make our decisions, but then sometimes our decisions turn around and make us. I mean, we're free to choose our actions, but we're not always free to choose the consequences of those actions, right? I mean, the person you are right now is the sum of all the decisions you've made in the past. Jesus said, if you want to know and do God's will, he will reveal truth to you. So if you have some tough decisions to make right now, Go to God's Word. Get on your knees. Ask God to give you guidance. And watch. He will do it. Because making the right choice is very important. Um, we just recently celebrated the resurrection of our Lord and Savior. I want to talk about why the resurrection is important. It, it's basically our assurance. In 1 Peter 1, verses 18 and 19, actually... Let's start in verse 16. 1 Peter 1, verse 16. Because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. And if you call on the Father, who without respect of persons judges according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear, for as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation, received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who by him do believe in God, that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory, that your faith and hope might be in God. You know, this wasn't an ordinary crucifixion on Calvary's cross. You know, people walking by might have thought, oh, you know, there's three criminals getting what they deserve, paying the penalty for their crimes. But there was something much greater going on. There was something of cosmic proportions happening there. Sin was judged, and Satan was defeated right there, right there at the cross. That wasn't everything that happened. The cross was where the greatest purchase in the history of the world was ever made. The greatest purchase. It was there that Jesus Christ shed his blood to pay for all the sins of mankind, to pay for the salvation of all who will accept. You know, this, this transaction came at a great price. It was the shed blood of Jesus. How do you know that God accepted Christ's blood as the atoning sacrifice for our sins? How do you know? You ever ask yourself that? How can you be sure that the Savior's death fully paid the debt that we should have to pay? Have you ever asked yourself that? I think 
The answer is in the resurrection itself. Jesus said on many occasions he would rise from the dead. Matthew 16, verse 21, John 2, verse 9, John 10, verse 18, and several other places. And fulfilling that kind of prophecy is no small task. You have to understand, he spoke it before it happened. That's how God shows that he is truly God, by telling you the outcome before it gets here. Prophecy. Nearly a third of the Holy Scriptures are prophecy. Jesus spoke a lot of prophecies. Um, think about those people who witnessed his death on the cross and then saw him walking the earth three days later. On the earth for 40 days. Over 500 witnesses saw the resurrected Christ. The Bible says we're two are gathered. I am there. A witness only takes two or three people. More than 500 saw the resurrected Christ. That's a pretty firm confirmation. They saw him alive. Christ returned to life. This was God's way of showing that he accepted the offering that was made on our behalf. It was God's proclamation to the world that the sin debt had been paid in full. And everyone who trusts in Jesus Christ the Son are free from the penalty, and the power of sin. The resurrection is our assurance that every promise that God has ever made can be trusted. That's great news. God has broken the power of sin. He's broken the power of death. He's broken the power of Satan. He's broken the power of the flesh. And everyone who puts their faith in Jesus Christ is going to enjoy God's eternal presence throughout history, throughout eternity. That's the kind of God we serve. That's the kind of Savior we serve. We have a faith that is seen. In Mark 2 verse 5, when Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. Wow. You know, faith can be seen. In the same way that Jesus was explaining to Nicodemus in John 3 verse 8, faith is like the wind. Faith itself is invisible, but saving faith is always accompanied by a corresponding action that can be seen. James 2, verse 17 through 26. It wasn't just the faith of this, this crippled man, but it was also the faith of those four friends in Mark 2, verse 3. This shows the, the power, the, the, the demonstration, the effect that our interceding faith, uh, faith <laughs> interceding faith, uh, our interceding faith can have on others. Jesus saw their faith. He saw it. But even though our faith released on the behalf of others is powerful, it's not a substitute for them having faith also. Okay? But it does help. The person who's going to receive the miracle must have some degree of faith, even if it's as small as a grain of mustard. Um... Even Jesus couldn't produce healing in those who wouldn't believe. Uh, Mark 6, verses 5 through 6. I think it's evident this crippled man also had the faith because he wasn't resistant to the four who brought him. And he got up and he obeyed Jesus' command without having to be helped up. See, people were grumbling, who is this man? Who is this man who can forgive sin? Hmm. I mean, why would Jesus minister forgiveness of sins to this man instead of meeting the obvious need he had of healing his, his uh, paralysis, his palsy, his, his crippledness? I mean, God is more concerned with the spiritual health of a man than his physical health, don't you think? I mean, Jesus, through a word, might have perceived that the real cry of this man's heart was to be reconciled with God. I mean, in some cases, not all cases, but in some cases, sickness was a direct result of sin. So Jesus would be dealing with the very root of this paralysis. And it doesn't explain whether or not this man's paralysis was a direct result of sin or not, but sin in our life that hasn't been forgiven does allow Satan to keep us in bondage, to keep us in chains. And because... Jesus' act of forgiving this man's sin, this paralyzed man was free to receive all the blessings of God, which included healing in his physical body. 
I think the point Jesus is trying to make is that both forgiveness of sins and the healing of this paralyzed man are humanly possible. You know, Jesus is saying, you know, look, if I could do one of these things, I can do the other. He healed this paralyzed man, showing that, yes, indeed, he does have the authority to forgive sins. You know, back in Jesus' day, people were more inclined to accept his willingness to heal them than they were to accept his forgiveness of sins without the keeping of the law. I mean, today, the church world basically accepts forgiveness of sins, but sometimes doubts his willingness to heal them in their body or bless them in their finances or lead them in the right direction or provide them with the right mate. You know, forgiveness of sins and healing of our bodies, I don't think was ever meant to be separated. So we need to believe and receive all that God has in store for us today, tomorrow, and every day after that. Believe and receive. Hmm. Jesus can heal your body. He can forgive your sins. He can cleanse your heart. He can lead you into his will. He can answer your prayers. Now, sometimes the answer is no, or not yet, but there's no one else that can do what Christ can do. Jesus is the only name under heaven by which you must be saved. Jesus is the only way to God the Father. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Do you believe it? And I sure hope you do. I love you guys. God bless you. Good Lord willing, I'll see you again tomorrow.